Okay, I had a job many years ago, and the job was to uh, face this end. This, uh, I've got this drawn here. It actually was a coupler. This was a coupler for a tower mill drive shaft, is what it was. Um, up here, there was another half of a coupler, a little stub shaft that went on to a flex coupling with some upper bearings. And anyway, it drove this, and I forget, I think they were only 400 horse motors on those, but lots of reduction. Um, the outside, this, this assembly here held a whole bunch of auger flight that went on here. When this was in place, it was five or six foot in diameter with augers that were screwing things up. So this was kind of a, the smaller part of the whole operation. But the job was, like I say, to face this site. Several times we'd come in here and build up areas for bearings and different things on the shaft. But we had to fix this face. These were getting eroded away and beat up to where they were letting the brakes, the bolts, their bolts through here letting the bolts break, the keyways were getting ate out, and just, it was pretty nasty. Um, I don't remember how we machined, what the whole machining on the keyway was. I'm sure we were using, oh no, no, we were using our horizontal mill and floating the far end on the bridge crane. That's what we were doing, yeah, doing the whole <laughs> floating it trick. Because it was, our lathe was roughly, I don't know if it was a full 10 foot between centers, but it wasn't over 10 foot. So when we did this, this end out here was on steady rest rollers. And so now, um, and our lathe was a 26 inch lathe. And you go, and uh, this right here, it was 12 inches, give or take. How do you do this on a 26 inch lathe? Before we come back to the sketch here, let's go look at our lathe that we got out here, which is about a 32 inch, a little bit bigger but still wouldn't do a 34 like that. Oh, that's right. Sorry. They get in our copyright problems. Whatever it was, they weren't playing. Um, so of course you get here, The flange, well, if the flange was out that side, you know, if the flange was out that side of the lathe on a steady rest, um, hanging out, you wouldn't, uh, you know, you got nothing to cut with. You're not going to cut on this side here. The drive of it, to start with, the drive, we welded a solid piece onto the inside of it because I didn't need, the flange had a center section that wasn't used. So the center section of it could just be cleaned off with a grinder. So... I think we had like a six or eight inch area in the middle. So a piece of solid shaft that we'd weld on nice and solid there and we could chuck it up. Gave us a little bit of distance out. The next thing we did was the gap. And it and, uh, wasn't, actually most of the guys there just wanted me to say we couldn't do it. Um, sometimes there's an advantage to that. Had I said we couldn't do it, since one of the guys that really wanted me to say we couldn't do it had a little more pull than me, we might have gotten a bigger lathe next year or the year after. Probably would have been two years. Uh, but in the meantime, the company would have suffered. And they were actually machines that made us money and we got ten to $20,000 a year in bonuses. And I kind of wanted to see things work. Um, but the bigger lathe would have been nice too. I don't know what they're doing today. They might still have just the 26 inch lathe up there. I don't know. Anyway, okay, so you have this flange here, pulled the gap out, and then what happened was the flange is setting here with the space on a steady, re on a steady rest on the other end. I took the compound off of the carriage, and then I made a big piece of two-inch plate that was a U that came around to the other side. And I made them out for the carriage to, for the uh, compound to fit over here. And it had like a, whatever the width of the, con it was a smaller lathe than this. It wasn't, it was probably an eight inch section, I'm guessing. It seems looking at this lathe, but could have been as narrow as six, but I don't think, I think it was probably an eight inch wide section that was here and a U that went around and connected on. 
And of course, as you could see, if you did that, you'd have just this big floppy thing, even down to two inch plate, boring bar. So what I did was we had where the steady rest, where the um, gap had been, we had a bolt on there. So I made a bracket for underneath with a whole bunch of little pads that I could oil and set screws so I could adjust where they came. And previous to doing this, I had machined the plate flat. It was torch cut, but machined the bottom of it flat here, along with the bottom of it flat and the top of it to fit the compound. So now we could come in here, and as you move this, they would both move together, and you just had this U connector in between the two so that uh, you could come back and forth, and you could come in here, and you could face them. And I did a dozen of them that way. So... Um, they all got cleaned up. We talked about for a while, another thing too, we talked about setting up to face them with uh, portable equipment. And if I was doing it now, because I hadn't done, I'd done some portable at that time, but not as much, I would probably give more credence to the idea of uh, doing it as portable machining. Um, one of the guys was also pretty interested in that, but he... He was not, in quotes, a machinist for us, but he was a machinist. He used to have a machine shop of his own, in fact, the one that was really wanting to see it done that way. And he, be, he was one of the machinists at the mill after I left. Um, because we were all officially mill mechanic level sixes. Or slang terms, they would call us millwrights. But um, you would pretty much find one guy was a machinist, someone else is a welder, someone else did concrete. Together we did mill writing, which was whatever needed to be done to make it work. And I've been seeing that on Facebook here lately too, is a lot of people, because there's this mill write people that for some reason are putting out lots of pictures of old, large machine work that was being done somewhere and they're talking about the mill writes doing it. And they could have been mill writes doing it. Because um, mill writing is a very, craft of a lot of things. It really is. Um, and that's also a problem when you go, if you meet a millwright and you see what all he knows, the next millwright may not know the same things. Uh, some of the old guys know a little bit of all of it. And some of them come in new on a crew. They only know one thing. Most places get by with the millwriting because they have a variety of people they overstaff the job, and somewhere in there is somebody that knows what to do, and he can tell the other 20 guys on the crew, you know, follow along, this is what we're doing for his craft. Like when we were doing concrete work. I didn't know anything about concrete work, you know. I mean, basically, you mix it up, you pour it in, it's like, like set, you know, self-setting cake. But um, no, there were a lot of things I didn't know, other guys did, so I followed along. And you learn a little bit while you're doing that too. It's, it's actually, it's really pretty neat to work on a millwright uh, crew because of that. So, uh, yeah, anyway, probably no reason to really draw you up on the board. I think we made it pretty clear, seemed clear to you, Bert, that, yeah, uh, yeah just plate. And it worked, it worked well. Um, it worked very well for that. So that was how we were able to stretch our, it was a summit. 26 inch lathe and just for the record the ones I've used the summit 20 you know that size lathe kind of wimpy for a 26 inch lathe it was really I mean we really had it overworked I think that part was about 8,000 pounds and it was really too much for that poor little lathe but it did the job so you know it's on the other hand while I say it was kind of wimpy for what it was it uh you got to also give it a praise for doing more than it ever should have.